Good morning, everyone, and then welcome back to the, his uh, Professor Alexander Heisterkamp's second lecture. Um, for the students and uh, also professors who attended, who did not attend uh, yesterday's uh, lecture, I'd like to uh, introduce Professor Heisterkamp at the beginning again. Um, Professor Dr. Alexander, Alexander Heisterkom is an expert in biomedical optics with special interest in nonlinear imaging and manipulation of cells and tissues, laser therapy and diagnostics, and also nanoparticle laser interaction. He holds a professorship for biophotonics at Le uh, Leibniz University, Hannover, and also he is a scientific director at Laser Centrum, Hannover. And this year, this year he is a distinguished guest professor of Keio University. He's a fellow of SBIE, and also uh, he's involved in the uh, two large extents of cluster in Germany. First one is the extents cluster of rivers, and he's a leader of the uh, research group in cell surgery. Now he's also a member of the uh, extents cluster of hearing for all. So uh, today's his lecture, he will give up. Uh, details on the applications of laser-based manipulation, including cell surgery, transfection, and also optogenetics. So uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Pre uh, Professor Heister come here, and then uh, please start. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and once more for hosting me here. It's a pleasure and honor um, to be um, here at Keijo University in uh, Professor Tarakawa's group. And, uh, with all his students here. And I <clears throat> have two introductory slides similar as Mitsuhiro introduced me once more, but mo most of the faces I saw yesterday as well, but just that you know uh, where I'm from. So again, I'm from, from Hanover Leibniz University, which is sort of right in the middle of Germany, a little bit to the north side, so maybe one and a half hour by train from Berlin and one hour from Hamburg and below here. We have Nuremberg and, and Munich. <clears throat> and in Hanover, I'm affiliated or I'm teaching at Leibniz University. And um, some of my labs, uh, are, or most of my labs I started with, uh, were at the Laser Centrum in Hanover, which is an uh, own institution apart from the university trying to drive applications of lasers in all kinds of areas, and I'm uh, especially involved with the biomedical optics department led by uh, Tamo Ripken. <clears throat> and since recently, since 2014, we have a joint institute focusing on interdisciplinary research in the medical field together with clinicians, biologists, and um, engineers and chemists or physicists like I am. So, <clears throat> in case you, you need my contact details, in the end I have once more my email address. It's the easiest if you send it. But if you Google it, you probably might find some of the Internet addresses concerned with the LZH or Knife or the medical school. They should all work, basically. I mean, some of them are, if you find Jena, that's my former affiliation. Yeah, that doesn't work anymore. But if you find any email address concerned with me and Hanover, that should reach me. Yeah, but that's my main email address. Everything is forwarded to. So when I <coughs> started working in the laser field, my first application of a laser system I developed was in eye surgery. And actually, when I was in the beginning or uh, uh, spring of this year here, I uh, told you a little bit about the applications in the eye. So I'm not going to concentrate today on the eye, but I want to motivate maybe the laser therapy, and that's basically where I started to use femtosecond lasers in surgery. So <clears throat> the idea at that time was to replace a certain kind of very precise scalpel uh, with a laser system and ended, for example, uh, with a clinical device, a femto LDV uh, from the Zima group, which is basically providing that commercially nowadays. And uh, in, my, in my PhD, I developed the full femtosecond uh, surgery in the eye to overcome um, uh, myopic or uh, press, um, um, myopic vision or miss vision in the eye <coughs> or refractive errors. And that ended up in the, in the Visomix MAX system from um, 
Zeiss nowadays. So actually, I did a lot of, at the laser center working or applying femtosecond lasers, for example, for refractive surgery, so treating the anterior part of the eye. And nowadays, we still involved at the biomedical optics department. A lot of the community now focusing on, focuses on processing the lens for, for example, overcoming presbyopia, so far sightness in, at older age, or treating cataract, which is uh, um, yeah, um, turning um, gray of the, of the human lens with higher age, and it has to be explanted, and you get an artificial lens in and some of it in corneal transplants and capsulotomy. So, um, as I said, I already taught about that um, in, in the beginning of the year. Um, but if you see here, you basically all the time you're working inside of the material. And if you look at the fundamental laser interaction for therapy, you can nicely do that with the so-called Boulnois diagram, diagram developed in, in the 80s where you plot the interaction time of your laser over the intensity uh, in watts per square centimeter. And you see that all the interaction mechanisms which are there of lasers in therapy for medical use are in similar regimes of energy densities. Yeah? So you see if you plot here time and you plot intensity here, basically these lines are fixed values of, for example, joule per square centimeter. Yeah? And you see if you have a very long interaction time yeah, at very low intensities or low powers, yeah, you get in the field of the so-called photochemistry, which is just a simple application would be, okay, you go out in the sunlight, the sunlight is interacting on very long scales at moderate or low intensities with your skin, and you're, um, uh, you're producing vitamin D in your body. Yeah? That's why you, for example, need to be outside to produce vitamin D. Yeah, if you get a little bit higher, we all know, okay, you can get some photo damage and other kind of photochemistry in your skin if you get a sunburn um, and so on. And you know, if you have even higher intensities yeah, um, of, of light, you can actually yeah, burn um, tissue, for example, at shorter time scales, and then what we call coagulate, which means you <clears throat> denature or you modify the proteins in the tissue irreversibly, yeah? and that is usually goes together with the shrinkage of the tissue. This can be, for example, helpful if you want to cut very um, heavily vascularized tissue like liver, yeah? so basically it shrinks and thereby you seal the cut and you have a bloodless scalpel if you want. Yeah? So for example, in some applications in medicine, it's, it's needed that you have a thermal interaction and you have a thermal modification, but you can imagine if I want to treat the human eye, I don't want to have this shrinking and heavy thermal side effects. So then we come to the field of photoablation, which is not so much defined by a mechanism, like these ones are just thermally defined. Yeah, you have a linear absorption and a mechanism, heat is coupled to the tissue and you have a thermal modification of tissue. This one is just defined by a very precise ablation of material of tissue. And this can be by thermally induced, but it can be as well chemically or photochemically induced. Yeah? And if you go to, to treat your eyes for uh, myopia, for example, usually the systems are based on UV lasers, which are in the range of some nanoseconds, yeah? and, and use photoablation to ablate the tissue. Yeah? Um, at even higher intensities and very short pulse durations, you have the photodisruption. And this is really different from all the other interaction mechanisms. At these interaction mechanisms are mostly based on linear absorption, which means you have a laser beam, and if you illuminate your tissue right when you start to hit the tissue, you have your interaction. Yeah? And probably that at this point, the intensity is the highest, so you're starting to treat or process your tissue from the surface on. Yeah? And if I want to work inside the material, um, <clears throat> then I need a nonlinear absorption, and very similar to what I've shown you yesterday, where we had lower intensities to do nonlinear imaging, you can now imagine if we now increase the intensity, uh, some orders of magnitude, we can now treat tissue. Yeah, I'll show you um, in a minute. So how does that work in contrast to this imaging? Yeah, you have basically a, a focused laser pulse, and then at the 
at the focus region, you don't have now a fluorescence or some, some um, other processes um, like second harmonic generation or else what I showed you yesterday. You have an energy deposition by nonlinear absorption, which means you not only induce a fluorescence process, but rather deposit energy um, to the atoms, which afterwards um, end up, or if you deposit energy, you ionize the material, which means you turn it into a plasma. And then when the electrons relaxate um, and give the energy to the heavy atoms, um, then basically the sample is heated and you have an expansion and this is creating this rapid expansion, a shock wave. And then afterwards this tissue can expand further and basically tear open the material, which we call in a liquid environment, this would be, for example, a cavitation bubble. And afterwards you have maybe some remaining protoproducts of the chemical reaction, which results in a permanent uh, gas bubble. Okay, why am I showing this graph? I'm, I mean, one motivation why using laser pulses in material processing, it's very often called cold ablation, but it's not really true because it's still, as you see, you're creating a plasma, you're depositing heat. So at the focus, you have quite high temperatures. If you look at the electrons, once the electron relaxate, you still have very high temperatures, but they are very well defined in the region of your focus. Yeah? Because the thermal diffusion time Depending on the material in metals, it's much faster, but in tissue, it's more relaxed. So it's maybe on the order of microseconds. So which means, okay, if you have a pulse shorter than the thermal diffusion time, you can deposit the energy very efficiently without your heat flowing out of, outside of the focal region. Yeah? If, if you're in the regime of photocoagulation with very long, like milliseconds illumination time, you're coupling energy to the tissue and then your interaction zone is much larger than your, than your, than your focal region because the, the heat is just by convection flowing out of uh, your focus region. Yeah. So therefore, if you're having laser sources with very short pulses, and this can be already uh, in the range of 60 nanoseconds or shorter, you have what we call thermally confined or thermal confinement, which means, okay, only the focal region is really your, the zone of thermal interaction. Yeah. Okay, but then why using really ultra short and not just short pulses? And the reason is you can further reduce the energy yeah? Be because you saw that they are all on a fixed yeah, energy per area, but if you reduce the pulses further, you basically get um, smaller um, energies at a smaller spot. Yeah? So which means if, if I plot that now, the, the fluence needed for to get such a nonlinear effect yeah? So this was from imaging, and now if we use not two photons, but maybe four photons, we have a very similar spatially confined effect, like the slide I, I showed you yesterday. And if I now look at the pulse duration, yeah, you see that the intensity I need to reach a modification of the tissue is now growing, yeah? and this is a logarithmic scale, so this is really growing drastically. But on the other hand, if I plot the energy per area needed for this one, I can reduce this really by, by orders of magnitude as well. So, and then I can go, come to a range where I'm using only nanojoule of energy um, in that area. And therefore, then the interaction of your pulses is really confined to a maybe micrometer scale. So, and if I'm at the range of one micrometer, I'm really in the range of single cells or subcellular resolution, and that's motivating like the, the field I want to show you a little bit today, like laser applications in regenerative medicine, which deals a lot, like I told you yesterday, in um, um, regaining regenerative capacity in, in the human body. For example, one example would be like the circle once uh, came up by Kreuzer and Messe, and I changed that a little bit, where you say, okay, you have a patient which suffers from some disease where the body cannot fully regenerate. For example, um, in infarcted heart and the damage of your heart muscle tissue, like I told you yesterday. And then you take some cells into cell culture. Yeah? And this graph from 2005 was formerly like, just going this way around. So at this point, people thought, okay, we have to somehow get a tissue culture where we can grow, for example, heart muscle cells and give it back to the patient. But the only way at that time was okay, so-called somatic cloning, yeah, where you take an oocyte, 
uh, uh, take out the cell nucleus and then you fuse these two cell systems to get basically one cell containing mostly the cytosol of this oocyte. Yeah? And from this fused cell, you can get basically uh, a blastocyst, which, which means, okay, you have uh, a number of stem cells from this patient cells. Yeah, that was in those days, 2005, the only way to basically reach stem cells with the DNA matching the patient. Yeah? Nowadays, we know, okay, we have the so-called IPS cells, yeah, induced pluripotency stem cells, where you can basically avoid this, this uh, really tedious pr procedure of uh, som somatic cell nuclear transfer, as we call it. Yeah, but if some of you know from the early days of cloning, the first animal cloned was Dolly, the sheep. Yeah? Uh, and this was cloned with this procedure. Yeah? Basically, they took from, uh, from Dolly one cell yeah? and fused it with an oocyte and thereby uh, reprogrammed the, the nucleus. I come back to that. Yeah? But once you have the stem cell culture, you can then add differentiation factors and so on and do tissue engineering. And basically in these fields, I give you some examples of, of laser applications where we can use this very tightly focused femtosecond lasers with side effects on the micrometer or sub-micrometer scale. Yeah? Once again, to, to reach this pre precision, one thing is to get a very short pulse that you, you need uh, very little energy, but on the other hand, you can use a very high NA, yeah? so which means like yesterday you saw, okay, the numerical aperture resembles how tightly you focus your laser beam, and if you see 0.5 NA is already quite tight focusing, then we need to reach an optical breakdown or basically a permanent ablation inside the tissue, we need roughly like 16 or 17 nanojoules. Yeah? And you see what I plotted here is the density of free electrons. Yeah? So, okay, the color scale, probably you cannot see it from the back, but usually the densities you're reaching is maybe 10 to the power of 21 per cubic centimeter or 10 to the power of 20. Yeah? And below here, you have 10 to the power of 19, and here 10 to the power of 17. So this would be something what Alfred Vogel, a colleague of mine, calls a low-density plasma. And this is now a sort of high-density way where you get ablation. But if you compare it, if you're a plasma physicist, you wouldn't speak of high-density plasmas at even at 10 to the power of 20 per cubic centimeter, because that's only a few percent of the atoms are ionized. So it's in, in general terms, it's a low-density plasma, but for a laser ablation physicist, that's the high density. Because you cannot go much higher, 10 to the power of 21, 10 to the power of 22, that's the limit. Because at that point, the plasma uh, frequency comes into the range which scales with the density of the carriers in the range of the laser frequency. And from that point on, the plasma gets reflective. Yeah? So with a laser, you usually can only reach plasma densities which match the plasma frequency of your driving laser, and therefore the density of these plasmas is limited. And in our case, it's roughly 10 to the power of 21. Yeah, so you see in the middle, we reach this here, and basically this resembles or scales with the energy deposition. Yeah. So within this area, I'm depositing my energy, which, which relaxates afterwards and changes my tissue. Yeah. So you see this is like 12 micrometer in, in extent in the axial direction and lateral direction, this is differently scaled. Yeah? So this is uh, one micrometer, so basically two micrometer in width. And if I now go to 0.6, you see the area shrinks and 0.75 and so on. So if I come to 1.2, like a microscope with immersion, could be water immersion or oil immersion, yeah? you're getting um, basically diffraction limited zone of, um, of um, plasma densities where you reach the 10 to the, 10 to the power of 22. So this is maybe 200 nanometer in, in X and Y direction and in the lateral, uh, in the actual direction you have maybe one micrometer or 0.7 micrometer. And with this one, a cell has maybe the extent of let's say 12 micrometers. So this field here yeah, or 20 micrometers. So you see, okay, with 0.5, you would basically destroy a whole cell, but with this area, 
you can even manipulate subcellular structures of a living cell. Yeah? Okay, that was not started um, <clears throat> recently. So actually one pioneer of this uh, laser manipulation surely is Michael Burns. Um, and you see this is a, a publication in Scientific American we have, where he made for the general public an article on what lasers can do. And if you, if you look up Michael Burns, you will find several of science-related publications or, or in Science Magazine. Yeah, which are resembling this one as well. Yeah, so well previously I have some citations in the following. Yeah, but you see his idea was okay. You can use on one hand laser tweezers to hold a cell in place, and then maybe do a second laser beam to uh, cancel out chromosomes or to open the membrane with this. And Michael Burns pioneered a lot using UV lasers. That's why you see okay he using he's using infrared lasers to hold the cell in place. And the blue resembles the UV laser scissors or micro scissors, how he, how he turned it. And he came up in this article with a very similar graph, which is close to what I've shown you before from the Boulnois di diagram in 84, yeah, where you see he plotted exposure time uh, over uh, irradiance. Yeah, and you see it's basically the same area. So you can just take the same what you have in, let's say, macroscopic laser surgery. Yeah, if you have very tight focusing conditions, you can use the same, of course, uh, at a cellular scale. Yeah, and you see, for example, it allows scissors to perform optoporation, which I uh, show you in the following a little bit, creation of temporary holes uh, in the cell membrane and so on, breaking of molecular bonds, or you can treat here oocytes. I show you a little bit of this one. Yeah. What's maybe interesting as well is induction of photochemistry. I have some aspects of, of that as well. Yeah. But even Michael Burns, if you go back in time, is, is not the pioneer in that sense of, of treating cells or tissues with high accuracy. If you go back then, I would say maybe Chachotin in, in the times of 1912 yeah, came up. So he was uh, a Russian at that time, but he had to flee from the from the Russian Revolution, and then he he came to Germany, and you see, okay, published some things in in German Strahlenstichmethode, which means okay, uh, perforation method using rays. Yeah, so it's not a laser ray, of course, in 1912, but you see, the wavelength is UV, and he used uh, a spark from a discharge. Yeah, so if you have basically an electric discharge, you're creating in air, you can create quite uh, uh, an amount of UV radiation, and he used that to perforate, I think it was plant cells in, in that one, to study the perforation of membranes with this, yeah, to perforate uh, them. Okay, and he had to flee then uh, in, in Germany with the rise of the Nazis, he had to flee again, and so it's a long story. He had really not a, uh, an easy life, yeah. Um, but, okay, that was in 1912. And then um, later on, Nomarski, for example, used uh, a similar method, yeah, um, but with much higher precision because he had now really objectives which were UV transparent, yeah, basically uh, showing low absorption in this UV range and therefore he could achieve a quite high um, accuracy, I think he ablated in living cells mitochondria with UV lasers for the first time. Yeah. Then afterwards, with the uh, invention of the laser by Maiman, they were actually uh, quite the first to apply it briefly after the invention to treat single cells. Yeah. So, and then from the 60s on, basically Michael Burns put out several of pioneering papers in using his UV micro scissors and really showed and studied several applications there. And then in, with the femtosecond lasers, Carsten König <coughs> was one of the first who applied it in the femtosecond laser. He was at that time a postdoc in Michael Burns' lab in, at UC Irvine and then came back to Jena and further developed his studies. Yeah. I mean, the, the difference between maybe the use of this femtosecond lasers and the UV lasers of Michael Burns previously is that with the femtosecond lasers, I can apply, as I showed you, nanojoule energies per pulse, yeah, in contrast to microjoule 
for the UV lasers at the nanosecond pulses, which means, okay, you have a factor of one uh, to 1,000 or even 100,000 difference in energy. Yeah? And so you, in, in one time, you couple one nanojoule to the whole cell, and in the other time, you couple 10,000 times the amount. And this is leading to heating and stress to the cell. So you could say because of this short pulses, you really, the total energy you deliver to the cell is reduced drastically. So it doesn't really, like you see, that's what I want to convey, doesn't really have to do anymore with the pulse duration and the thermal heat flow, because even with nanosecond pulses in tissue, you are fine. Yeah? It's different if you're treating metals, because uh, the heat conduction in metals is much faster compared to tissue. Yeah? But it's really the energies which, which matter a lot. Okay, and, and you see like one of the papers, for example, was in, in 1981 in, in science where he had light laser microsurgery in cell and developmental biology. I don't know if this paper made it on the cover of science or he had um, another one basically where he made the, made the front page and he was able to write a peace sign into a living cell or into the nucleus, yeah. And he made that uh, with an army grant, so the, arm, the army was not really happy about that, but maybe it was a little bit earlier than 81, yeah, but um, I think he lost that <laughs> grant at that time, but anyway. Okay, so, um, so you see when, when I studied it, I basically um, I came across this, this um, gentle ablation starting in eye surgery where I thought, okay, I studied the interaction, this is a cornea, where I try to make a smooth cut in the cornea. And you see, okay, if we reduce the, the energy we couple to this tissue system, we get a very smooth cut here, yeah, so very fine cut. Yeah, and then basically, um, if you go even further, uh, reduce the energy to some nanojoules, you see you can even ablate single mitochondria in a living cell. So how does that work in, um, um, in detail? Um, in water, you have to overcome a certain energy gap, similarly like the fluorescence gap or like the, the excitation for fluorescence like you've seen yesterday and the transition to the excited level where you say, okay, in, in fluorescence microscopy, it's usually maybe a couple of electron volts. And in water, to achieve uh, a plasma generation, we assume usually something like 6.5 or 7 electron volts of energy gap. Yeah? But if you look at the ionization um, gap for a water molecule, it's not six and a half electron volts, it's more something like 13 electron volts. Yeah? But this is because of the interaction of the different water molecules with one another that you get something like a semiconductor. Yeah? So in a theoretical model, you can assume water to be something like a semiconductor where you have a conduction band and a valence band and you can lift electrons to become so-called excitons, which then can further uh, take up energy and then generate further quasi-free electrons. And the, okay, the energy gap is six and a half electron volts. If you would use linear absorption, this would take UV lasers like 190 nanometer. If you have a two photon absorption, of course, then 380 and so on. So you see, if you would use an infrared laser at 950, you would use maybe five photons, right? 800 nanometers, something like four photons. Yeah? So, and once you have this free electron, and this is a graph from Alfred Vogel, where he thoroughly really described this mechanism. So if you want to go into detail about the mechanisms of femtosecond ablations in tissue, uh, I recommend you this article, Applied Physics B, in 2005. Yeah, I think, I don't know, it's a 50 pages or 30 pages. I don't know, it's quite a long paper. Yeah. But, um, but there you see that you, um, you, for example, let's say you, you have three photons which are absorbed and you have a quasi-free electron in, in water. And then this quasi-free electron can be ele accelerated by a single photon. Yeah? So this is the reverse process of if you have an electron which is traveling with a certain velocity and you basically um, de- accelerate this electron, you know that it emits a, um, radiation, yeah, Bremsstrahlung. Yeah? And this is the process of inverse Bremsstrahlung, which means, okay, a photon is absorbed and thereby the electron takes up kinetic energy. 
And if this takes up three times the kinetic energy, and it would then hit another electron, it can lift this electron in the conduction band as well. Yeah? Because you have one electron which has enough kinetic energy if upon collision with a bound electron, you end up with two free, quasi-free electrons. These can be further accelerated, and then they can do impact ionization once more. You have four, and you see that one, two, four, eight, and so on. You get an avalanche of free electrons. So you have always, even when you ablate metals, you have a two processes driving the creation of free electrons. One is the multi-photon ionization, and then, as a second process, the avalanche ionization or cascade ionization kicks in. Um, and, and that's usually if you have longer pulse durations, which means, okay, longer is in the range of 100, 200 femtoseconds, then the avalanche uh, ionization is quite uh, creating the major part of the free electrons. Yeah. But this one is really important because um, you starting with free electrons, you are, to be able to have this avalanche elect, uh, ionization, you need free electrons to start with. Yeah? And therefore, if you wouldn't have any multiphoton absorption, then your process would rely on impurities in your material. And therefore, you wouldn't have a defined threshold to, to process the material. So therefore, this is really important to create some free electrons in the focal re regime, which then uh, initiate this avalanche. Yeah? Okay, and then in the end, once you have the free electrons and the energy is deposited, we have basically two mechanisms in tissue which are creating an ablation. Yeah? And this really took a long time to, to understand. So on one hand, we have really a chemical bond breaking of molecules because of, for example, free electrons. Yeah? And we have a thermal effect, and especially if we apply multiple pulses on one position, we can have a thermal accumulation and then basically manipulate the tissue as well. This is especially the case if we use high repetition rates in the megahertz regime. Yeah? So you, you imagine what femtosecond laser systems are out there. We usually have two femtosecond laser systems. One are amplified laser pulses in the kilohertz rate regime, and the other ones are megahertz systems based on oscillator systems. Yeah? And if you do, for example, imaging, multi-photon imaging I showed you yesterday, you have a standard oscillator system at 80 or 100 megahertz. So you have 100 million pulses per second. And if you put that on a position of a cell, usually you have 10,000, 60,000 pulses acting on your cell. And therefore, you have a thermal accumulation over time. It's similarly, in, in material modifications, this effect is used, for example, for inscribing waveguides into materials with like a, a lot of pulses. Yeah. So in, in cell uh, manipulation, you see that we have then this kilohertz regime or we have this megahertz regime, depending on, okay, I'm using amplified pulses or I'm using uh, um, oscillator pulses. And here, uh, Alfred Vogel nicely put in a graph already 10 years ago, like some of the pioneering papers yeah, um, and put them onto the free electron density, which is reached following his theoretical calculations and what irradiance you are using there for. Yeah? For example, you see uh, this is the threshold for creating a really optical breakdown. So you have this free electron, say relaxate, you, you have a thermal expansion, a cavitation bubble, and then afterwards a collapse. That is a one, and you see a lot of these applications are at laser powers which are below the normal threshold. Yeah? And he called that therefore, because you see here only the electron density is reached of 10 to the power of 21. And here you have lower energy densities. So he called that like the low density um, plasma regime. Yeah? And actually with this low density plasma regime, you can do a lot of applications. For example, cell transfection, which means opening a pore in a cell membrane and so on. So this is not that you're creating a cavitation bubble and the membrane is poured, tear open. It's more like a consecutive effect of multiple pulses acting on the membrane. This could be, for example, a repeated photochemical damage of the molecules in the membrane, and then you have a hole in the membrane and afterwards it reseals. Yeah. But as well, we have, and I'll show you some applications in the kilohertz regime where you really do a cut like with, okay, I have a cavitation bubble, the tissue is tearing apart, and then I'm, I'm creating a clear cut. Yeah. 
for example, uh, one of these applications, and that as well, you see already in the late 70s, pioneered by Michael Burns, he used a UV laser to severe single stress fibers of a, of a living cell. And um, basically, uh, I don't know how much later, so nearly 30 years later, I, I did a similar um, study in, with Eric Mazur uh, in his lab, where we, you see here, I stained this actin fiber uh, now with this fusion protein I showed you yesterday. And actually, I'm focusing the femtosecond laser pulse on, on this single stress fiber. So let's see if this works. No, so. so you see this is severed, uh, the, the fiber, and then the two ends basically retract because the stress fiber in a, in a cell, it's something like the cytoskeleton of the cell, is under tension. And if you cut or snip basically a ribbon under tension, you know that it would retract in both ends. Yeah? So with this method, at that time, we tried basically to, to measure the stress on a single cell and then afterwards model the uh, stress behavior of the cell and how the cells distribute the stress and, and tension across the whole cell. So it was more like a method, method to measure the tension on a single actin fiber because there was no way to do that before. Yeah? And actually, the cell survives that as you're using these femtosecond pulses and it's much more gentle compared to the UV application Michael Burns pioneered in the uh, late 70s. Yeah. Similarly, there were application pioneered by, for example, Carsten König in, in 2000, where he ablated single chromosomes, yeah, like envisioned by Michael Burns on this cover from Scientific American. And then really important paper was from Tirlapur, uh, a PhD student from Carsten König in Jena, then um, in 2002 in Nature, where we focused the femtosecond pulse on a, on a cell membrane and he was able to deliver a strand of DNA into this cell. And then afterwards, this strand of DNA was coding for this green fluorescent protein I showed you yesterday. So once you delivered successfully this strand of DNA into a cell, the cell would start to produce this green protein and, and turn green. Yeah? So it's not that he, uh, that that's the final goal that you want to tell, turn cells green, but it's a good control just to see, okay, I successfully delivered a strand of DNA into the cell, and of course you could deliver any kind of strand of DNA, not coding for the green fluorescent protein, but maybe for correcting a certain kind of genetic disease into the cell. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> and um, other applications were, for example, this was in Eric's group in 2003 by, I think, Nan Chen at, at that time to ablate a single mitochondria with a femtosecond laser. So you see this is before and this is after ablation. But a very nice paper at that time was from uh, Yannick et al. together with Adela ben Yakar, um, where she, or they both cut neurons in a C. elegans. So C. elegans is a small worm, which is mostly transparent, and the neural system is well known. The whole genome is sequenced already back then, I think it was. Um, and there they could cut or severe a single neuron and then look at the recovery rate of these single neurons. Yeah? So basically, they cut, snip one of these neuron connections, and you see, okay, 24 hours afterwards, for example, this connection recovered, and you see you could then modify, okay, non-recovery, partial or full recovery, even based on behavioral tests, and you have something like an essay to study exon regeneration in a living system, yeah, to maybe you can test now certain drugs which enhance this uh, uh, neural regeneration. So, I mean, this regeneration is known in, in these animals, and of course, we have that to some degree too, but you know it's quite interesting to enhance drugs for nerve regeneration, for example, for severe the spine. So that was in 2004, and there were a couple of other papers by Yannick and by Adela and by Eric's group who worked on the C. elegans neural um, um, modification. I think there's even maybe eight years afterwards, there's a nature protocol paper on it, how you basically set up this system. Okay, if we uh, go back to this graph I've showed you before, um, at first I, for example, studied this uh, somatic cloning procedure where I thought, okay, 
um, at one point you have to get rid of the cell nucleus and then fuse the cell and we try to do that with the femtosecond laser but let me maybe first show you the standard cloning procedure with now which nowadays is still performed quite a lot yeah so especially if you think of a genetically modified cattle for meat production or for milk production then this is mostly done with somatic cell nuclear transfer yeah? so you see you have an oocyte yeah? so this is basically on the size of maybe 300 microns so it's well visible un under a microscope with moderate magnification and you have a sharp glass capillary and let me see if it fits and um, this is held in place with a gentle suction here on another glass pipette and you see the, the DNA in, in this oocyte is stained with a Hoechs dye, yeah? so with a um, basically bright blue dye which is not damaging the DNA and then afterwards, maybe I repeat that, Oops. so you see you can, if you Wrote, you can actually rotate it a little bit then you can turn on the fluorescent light and you can basically go in with it and then take out the DNA okay you have another bright spot here where you see well there's a second must be a second uh, uh, nucleus inside this oocyte but this is basically the polar body which contains DNA which the oocyte uh, doesn't use yeah so basically an, an oocyte has of course the genetic material from the mother and then some part of the chromosomes it doesn't need because it gets the other half of the chromosomes from the sperm. Yeah? So to get a full set of chromosomes and the polar body is basically the discarded um, DNA of it. So this can be left in. Yeah? And then... Uh, so you, so <coughs> you have then basically an, an oocyte without a nucleus and then you take up uh, one fibroplast yeah, with, a, with a nucleus and you inject it into this oocyte. So you basically afterwards have one oocyte with a living cell inside. And this cell is, for example, if you think of Dolly, is then the, the mother cell of Dolly or the cell from Dolly itself. Yeah? And afterwards you, um, you have to fuse these cells. Maybe I show this procedure. Yeah. So like I said, you have here the, the polar body and here you have the chromosomes usually in a certain stage of cell division, we call it metaphase plate. And so you enucleate these chromosomes, afterwards you inject the donor cell, but the cell still has its intact membrane around it. So you have a cell inside a cell which would not work. Yeah. So you then basically put it in an electric field, a strong electric field and thereby this, uh, this membrane is dissolved in the electric field. So you give it a short electric shock and you call that pathogenic activation, which then leads for the, for the oocyte to basically start cell division. Yeah? And you can imagine, okay, if you take an oocyte and you stab it twice with a knife yeah, and then you electrocute it, yeah, uh, the cell survival is really low. And that's why, for example, in the case of Dolly, it took really a lot of cells to try basically and outcome. Yeah, you have then other problems, DNA damage and so on, so that the efficiency of this cloning procedure is really below a percent. Yeah. And therefore we tried to, to apply uh, uh, femtosecond <coughs> ablation. For example, you see here you have in, in this video, we now have a multi-photon um, image so we basically go layer by layer we image uh, uh, the oocyte and it's stained for the Hoechs dye so in, in black and white now so you basically if I repeat it you see here the chromosomes and here you see the polar body and then we we had a, a program a software which scans or basically um, segments the, this part of the DNA and then scans in 3D all the chromosomes with a beam at 3 nanojoules. So we acquire an image at 0.1 nanojoule with a two photon fluorescence like I've shown you yesterday. And then we scan it with higher energy to have a four or five photon process to be able to ablate the material. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> so then afterwards, so this is the, the image, or maybe I start like before. So this is, 
Oh, this doesn't work, okay. So you see this is the movie before where you see clearly here are the, the chromosomes, yeah? And then directly after ablation, we once more scan it and you see only the polar body is left and basically all this, uh, these chromosomes are, are gone, yeah? Oops, okay. So that was in, in 2010, 2011, so um, why is not everybody using now femtosecond laser enucleation and so on? The problem was at that time that actually uh, these are the control cells, yeah, and these are the laser enucleated oocytes we have, yeah. Uh, I added a dye here, and you see that they are all gamma H2A X positive, which means they are that's a sensitive dye for double strand breaks. So we have a large amount, so we fragment all the chromosomes, and we have all these very tiny single base. Uh, chromosome fragments and the cell basically recognizes the severe DNA damage is taking place and stops all activation. So basically these oocytes, we couldn't activate them anymore and use it for, um, for it. So basically, I mean, we, we worked a little bit to improve that, but in the end we had maybe a percent of efficiency compared to maybe half a percent with traditional methods and that was not really a gain in, in it. I mean, on, on the other hand, you can, we then moved on to, okay, uh, can we maybe fuse the cells in, in, in these? So here you see, for example, then you have, we fuse two oocytes together, and that works quite nicely. Yeah? So, I mean, there are some applications out there where people use femtosecond lasers to dissolve the membrane of two neighboring cells, and then afterwards you see, basically, you can fuse them to, to become um, a single cell in this one. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, um, similarity to the study in, um, in the C. elegans swarm uh, from Adela and, and Yannick et al., um, people moved on to apply that as well in, in larger organisms, for example, um, in mice, and one pioneer in this mice study is, surely is Chris Schaefer, who's now at Cornell University, and the study he did together uh, with Nozomi Nishimura in 2006, he started that in David Kleinfeld's lab in San Diego. Um, he basically used these femtosecond lasers to do um, yeah, uh, tissue ablation in a living brain. Yeah? So basically he had a mouse, or he has a mouse system with an optical window implanted on, uh, on the head and you have then an optical access to the brain and he has a very similar system like I used, yeah, a, a kilohertz amplifier to be able to ablate cells. And then on the other hand, he has a second laser beam at lower powers to do a multi-photon imaging. Yeah, so he's using basically both what I've shown you in the lecture. On one hand, a high resolution nonlinear imaging. And on the other hand, a very precise um, ablation um, of this. Yeah, I don't know, is, do I have this? Is this slide gone? Doesn't work. Ah, there. Yeah, and this is, for example, an, an image yeah, of the microcapillaries in the brain. So basically, a perfused living brain, and he injected a certain dye to be able to get contrast. And he can now severe single capillaries here and induce something what he calls a microstroke to study the effect of, of strokes in a living brain, basically, and how the blood flow is reversed, uh, reversed and so on. So he, he has been doing that um, um, a lot um, in the recent years and came up with pharmaceutical screening and so on and other methods. Yeah. Okay, similarly, we, we work in now, nowadays in uh, on one hand, to use this cellular surgery in vitro, for example, on so-called organoids, which are little organs yeah, resembling, for example, the, uh, the intestines in this case. Yeah? So you have like a microorgan where we ablate a single cell and we can then basically see how this is expelled uh, from the organoid and how this regeneration in the, in the gut uh, would take place. Or so similarly, we, we apply that in liver, so that's really a preliminary study of sections, maybe one month old, where we ablated liver cells at certain points and we look at the damage evolving after ablation. Yeah? So that is basically an excised liver tissue, because then the, 
Temporal resolution is really poor because you can only keep it alive for maybe some hours in, in the media. And therefore, we developed now an in vivo system. Uh, actually, Stefan Karl is a postdoc of mine who took the technology from, from Chris Schaefer at Cornell to be able, um, basically, the, the insertion of the, of the window at the head to have that basically an, an abdominal window to be able to look at the intestines in vivo. So you see similar what we had as an organoid that was this one uh, crypt basically. And now we have really in the living system, we can image like several of them and do basically the same studies in, an, in a living animal. Or if you move the window to a different position, you can do imaging in the liver. Similarly, what I've shown you before in the liver section. So that's the point we are right now at this, where we have an ablation here at this point, And you can see the recruitment of basically leukocytes and uh, the immune response, and afterwards, basically, a full regeneration of the tissue. And there we study the capacity of, of liver regeneration, for example. <clears throat> Similarly, in a, uh, an, in a more in vitro system, we study now a repair mechanism of the heart muscle. Yeah? And, and therefore, if you look really at the smallest scale of a heart muscle, yeah, you could say this is basically a Z-disc um, of uh, the muscle structure within a single cardiomyocyte. So one heart muscle cell consists of these muscle strands here, yeah, and we now damage a single point of this muscle strand in one uh, single um, um, cardiomyocyte. Yeah? So, um, so let's see. So basically, we ablate now structures here. Similarly, what we've done in these actin filaments in this living cell, we study that now um, on a level of um, heart muscle and look at the cell reaction and so on, and basically do um, a similar study what maybe Chris Schaefer did in the brain, having something like a microstroke. Yeah, we induce something like a microinfarct um, of a heart on the level of a single um, heart muscle cell, basically, to have, in the end, maybe a means for pharmaceutical screening or reduce animal trials in this field. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and, and another field uh, which I put in here, this mark is basically, once you have this iPS cells, you, you want to add factors or basically differentiate these cells. This could be that you are adding proteins to the cells or DNA strands or actually turning these cells into iPS cells. You need to insert uh, gene sequences into cells and that's generally called transfection. And that's really a large field of application of ultra short and short pulses at the cellular level. Yeah, so meaning gene transfer into cells using uh, laser radiation. And um, again, that was not um, uh, for the first time used with femtosecond pulses in the paper I've shown you here in 2002 from Carsten König, but rather already uh, by Tsukakoshi in, in the year of 84. Yeah? So he used a frequency tripled uh, neodymium yak, yeah? but the efficiency was was very low, below a percent, again, yeah, of successful gene transfer into the cells. Yeah. Uh, and that was probably because of the, um, of the relatively long pulse duration of nanosecond pulses, because the energies, like I said, is 10,000 times higher compared to the nanojoule. And that similarly, Burns used the UV laser in 1987. So the efficiency, again, was below a percent. Yeah. And then um, Otto Greulich used, for example, to get a gene transfer into plant cells. That's very different between, because the membrane of the plant cells is completely different from the cells of human um, or, or eukaryotic cells. Yeah. Okay, with less energy, we had some developments, but basically the femtosecond pulses were pioneered by Carsten König. And then afterwards, we have Stevenson et al. from Kishan Dolakia at St. Andrews they made really a study of several thousands of cells to come up with a defined efficiency. Because in Carsten Koenig's paper, I mean, it's a pioneering paper, but it claims to have 100% efficiency. And as a scientist, usually you know, okay, 100% is always 
hard to get, except if you treat three cells and in three cells it's successful. And, and that's sort of how this paper is written. Yeah, it's still a pioneering paper, but the statistics are not really matching the, the I, I would say, um, the requirements of cell biology. Uh, you probably have to do it like repeated on several days and several uh, cell systems. That's, that's what Stevenson and I basically did for the first time in 2006. And then there are certain methods. And for example, yeah, Mitsuhiro uh, developed a different method in 2011 uh, using microspheres to focus the femtosecond radiation onto this one. And I think even before you, you had a paper on stress waves, also maybe 2006 or so, to, to permeabilize. So, so there are a lot of methods. So this is not a complete list of, of how people did that. But you have some of the pioneers, like Schneckenburger, for example, uh, in their Burns and, and Carsten König, probably, in, in this range. Yeah? And the advantage of laser radiation, basically, is you only drill a hole, for example, with femtosecond laser in the membrane, and then the DNA can diffuse into the cell. Other than with the conventional methods, yeah, you, can, you can use, for example, chemically uh, with lipofection a system, or you can, like I've shown you, inject it mechanically, yeah, but then the throughput is very low. Yeah, you, this is a standard procedure mostly, the viral transfer that might have um, basically some problems due to immune reactions of the immune system to this virus system. And you have electroporation, which has quite uh, high damaging side effects. But still you can achieve, achieve even in stem cells with this, for example, 20%. This is a very high efficiency. And nowadays there are a lot of sort of safe viral systems as well. But in, in principle, the laser-based methods are, yeah, then vector free if you want, and you can just deliver the pure DNA into the cells. And one advantage which the other methods might not have is you can in principle achieve a very high efficiency and number of cells with spatial selectivity. Yeah, if you think of, of a viral transfer, you, you give it to the body, you have to reach the uh, selectivity by certain markers on the surface of the vectors that they attach to a certain kind of cells. But uh, with a laser, basically, in combination with these methods, with the nanoparticles, for example, yeah, you can really tell where the cells should be transfected. So that's one major advantage of, of it. Yeah. So, but if you think of this perforation of the cell membrane, yeah, you should not think of it of a, of a rigid like skin of the cell. So the cell membrane is more like a really sensitive layer, like the skin of a maybe soap bubble, or um, and basically. You see that here, where they just added a media which resolves um, the membrane. So you see, basically, once you add this to the media, then basically all the, the, the self-organized structure falls apart, and all of the inside of the cell spills out. Yeah? And another nice example here from the Alberts, the standard book of, of cell biology, is seen here. So you have one cell with one extension here, a small extension of the cell, which is, of course, as well surrounded all by the cell membrane. And they have here a little uh, glass microsphere, which is kept in place with optical tweezers. So they basically can manipulate the sphere to move around. And on the surface of the sphere, they have molecules which tend to stick at the membrane. So you could now take this glass bead, and you, you see it in the movie. They uh, lead it towards the membrane, and then afterwards the membrane is sticking to the bead, and if you now pull on the bead, then the membrane is basically pulled upwards. And this is what you see, and what I want to motivate is that you see how, this, how flexible this membrane is. You can think of it more as, as a liquid flowing, because you have this lipid bilayer of just self-organized molecules of a few nanometer in, in width, which is really, really flexible. Yeah. So you see this is uh, the marking of the bead, and you slightly can see that it moves downwards here. Yeah? Downwards, and now it attaches here to the membrane, and you see now they pull upwards with it, and the membrane really follows. Yeah? And you see how flexible the cell membrane is. Yeah? And this is a picture you have to keep in mind if you want to perforate the membrane with a, with a laser. You will basically puncture a hole 
but then afterwards it will flow and close. So it's not that you're creating a hole and this would stay open like if you puncture our skin with, with a needle or something else. So it's a really liquid environment and as well to, to study the successful perforation, usually we can, for example, put in a dye and that were really early studies, yeah, which is not going through the membrane. Then we attack or tackle certain cells which we choose and then afterwards we wash off the dye and the cells which took up the dye are turning, for example, red and then we can tell, okay, we successfully perforated the cells. And nowadays, I mean, then you can count the number of cells you, you try to target, you count the number of cells turning, for example, red, and, and then afterwards you can come up with a kind of viability and efficiency graph, yeah? meaning, okay, viability is how many cells survived your procedure and then how many changed the color, and thereby you can come up with viability and efficiency. And in the community, I mean, you usually it's not done with this dye I've shown you here, that's an, an older graph. Usually we're using now a DNA strand coding for this fusion protein. And then when the cell takes it up, it reads out the DNA strand and builds a green protein. And thereby we know, okay, the DNA is still able to process DNA to, to generate new proteins and is still alive. And therefore that's a more valid method to prove really the efficiency. Okay, maybe this one I omit because of reasons of time. <clears throat> but um, the, the problem of this procedure basically is yeah, that uh, in this case the efficiency is very high so it's maybe 60, 70, you can optimize it to be maybe 80% yeah, and 100% viability yeah, but you have to tackle cell by cell. So, so if you want to perforate a single cell yeah, with it and you only need a very low cell number, that's probably a method you can go with, yeah? So that works. But if you talk to clinicians in regenerative medicine and I ask them, okay, we have a cell transfection system, they said, okay, maybe you start to, to perforate me four million cells, yeah? So four million cells is quite a lot number. If you think of it, you do it by hand, yeah? Judith Baumgart at that time, a, a postdoc of mine, yeah, she basically perforated it by hand and aligned it and basically shoot maybe eight cells per minute. Yeah, and if you calculate it, yeah, you get then a certain number of cells per hour and then per day, if you say 24 hours a day, yeah, you reach the cells and you say a postdoc works 365 days a year, yeah, 24 hours, then you reach exactly four million cells yeah, in one year. Yeah, so then you can imagine, okay, going shooting one by one, that's not a method you can go if you want to really get high cell numbers. And that's why a lot of the people like Mitsuhiro and, and me try to come up with ways to speed up the process using nanosystems or microspheres, which we tackle to the cells, and then we can irradiate a large number of cells at once, and we get a similar effect in a large number of cells. Yeah? And that's um, <clears throat> one method. Um, people use then were um, gold nanoparticles, and that's maybe the Pizzolides et al, I would say, is the pioneering paper in the membrane perforation. Although they didn't really use it to deliver a gene construct, they attached little particles to cells to kill them. Yeah? So actually they had a very high power to break the membrane, like I showed you before with this enzyme, where the membrane falls apart and the cell dies because it doesn't have this protective layer and this was in this paper where the cells with the X mark, they don't survive and the other ones survive and they get it. And then later, Gerion Hittmann from Lübeck, for example, he found that, okay, of course, if you have a lot of particles and you have really high laser powers, yeah, you can get cell deaths, yeah, but you have some regime where the membrane reseals itself yeah, and you don't kill the cell. So you open the membrane and afterwards it recloses because it's this liquid bilayer if you want. Yeah, and that's the thing we try to use with the nanoparticles where I put a lot of efforts maybe in the last 10 years. So you see how does it work? Yeah, we take gold nanoparticles and on, in this case, I'm sorry, this is still German, but um, I think the, it says plasmons can basically process materials. So if I put gold particles on a, on a semiconductor surface 
and I irradiate, irradiate the gold nanoparticles, you see that below where once nanoparticles are, I had li drilled little holes in this semiconductor. Yeah? And <clears throat> this is because in these gold nanoparticles, we, with the laser pulse, we start to drive a collective electron oscillation of the electrons in these particles. Yeah? So you see the electric field yeah, hits one of these gold nanoparticles, and the electrons in the gold nanoparticle are following the electric field. Yeah? So you have like uh, um, a resonance. You know, at certain points, you're hitting a resonance frequency of this system. And of course, the resonance frequency depends on the material and on the size of the particles. Yeah? And you see that with gold, this is very the typical line of this resonance frequency um, or co corresponding wavelengths is at 530 nanometer of gold. Yeah? So that's a very prominent wavelength. And then you can use that if you illuminate, for example, at the resonance frequency, you get a very high absorption at this frequency. So you can heat the gold particles very effectively with the femtosecond pulses. And thereby, the whole nanojoule energy is deposited in a nanoparticle which afterwards explodes, and you're creating something like a nanometer-sized explosion at the cell membrane. And this can rupture the cell membrane permanently or transiently. Yeah. This is one effect, but this leaves you with fragments of gold in the cells. Yeah. So if you just want to kill the cells or you don't want to reuse them in a human, that's OK. Yeah. But if you want to implant them in a human, you maybe don't want to have little gold fragments in the cells because very small gold fragments are quite toxic. So therefore, we focused a lot on this mechanism that basically the extinction of this gold nanoparticle at the different wavelengths is basically a mixture of absorption and scattering. So one part of the laser radiation is absorbed, at other frequencies, you get a much stronger scattering into the near field. Yeah, it's just, you can describe it exactly or analytically with me theory. So you get a me scattering into the near field. Yeah? And therefore you see, okay, if you have a certain nanometer size, 20 nanometer size particle, then basically this is dominated by absorption. But if you get, move away to larger particles, you see you have absorption but on the other hand, you have a stronger scattering. And this scales strongly with the size of the particle. And very briefly said for this lecture, if you get much larger particles of 200 nanometers, for example, they exhibit very strong scattering into the near field. And thereby, you can very effectively process materials using this near field. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> so this is um, shown in, in this graph here where basically uh, Netyakov et al. from Adila ben Yakar, they calculated this near field of these particles. For example, if you have two particles close to another, or this is basically as an ablation trace of a single particle, which was illuminated with a polarization in this axis. And you see, if you have one particle illuminated with this one, you're getting hot spots at these points, which resemble directly the ablation pattern in this thin gold layer, uh, what, what they looked at. Yeah, so you see that here, uh, modeled in, in my own group, the intensity distribution in vacuum, or if you place it on a certain layer, like a cell, uh, you can get a high intensity here, or even at certain conditions, you get the brightest spot just below uh, the particle. And there, you basically can think of attaching it to a membrane, and you can very efficiently um, ablate or permanently transfect these cells. So in the application, it would look like, okay, you have the cells here with the particles sitting at the membrane of the cell. You illuminate the whole dish with a short pulse femtosecond system, and you're creating this high intensity due to scattering, and then the DNA can be delivered. And this works really efficiently. So 90%, for example, in this if you scan it. Or, and again, the nice thing is not only that you can do it as well as maybe as a viral system, but you have a spatial selectivity. Yeah? So maybe you can see that we scanned here the, the logo of our excellence cluster rebirth. Yeah? We just had the laser scanned in a certain pattern, and only the cells in this pattern are taking up. So that's the only method where you can really uh, contact-free, sort of yeah, uh, have a spatial selectivity of, of gene transfection. Okay, the backdraw is yeah, that this doesn't work basically very well or the same with all sizes of molecules you want to deliver. So in principle, 
very small molecules work very well. Yeah? Very large molecule and especially charged molecules like DNA are not working that well. Yeah? So the larger the construct you want to deliver, the harder it is to get in. I mean, that's true for viral systems as well, but usually the viral systems can deliver much larger molecules compared to laser radiation. That's why currently we are looking much more in the range of small DNA, for example, or even not really DNA, but RNA, and applications of silencing RNA, for example. Yeah? So we have one group in this excellence cluster who works with treating heart disease or with uh, small interfering RNA therapy and started a, a company, and that's where we basically try to apply our laser de delivery methods for this small interfering RNA. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> as uh, maybe an, um, a little outlook, um, what, what else we do, I, I, um, I thought I'd give you some insight of maybe like, like another five to ten minutes, yeah? um, um, how we can use light to m manipulate tissue as well, and it's a, it's a growing field in the community as well, so the field of optogenetics, so maybe you heard already uh, about it. But I think if you, if you heard <coughs> optogenetics, uh, it most like over 90, 95% of the publications, uh, if you look at it, are dealing with neurobiology and with manipulating neural systems in living mice, for example, or, and these things. And I wanna give you a more general perspective on, on optogenetics because I, I think it might get really important in, in the field of biophotonics. So if you, if you look at basically light, of course the visible spectrum is, is only a small inset of, of the whole uh, electromagnetic wave spectrum. So we have the UV and X-rays and infrared and so on. And if I go to my uh, son's uh, room and I look at his uh, devices he's using to control robots or his little car, yeah, he's using basically a remote control and there are two types of remote control in his room present. Yeah? So one is, I mean, not this really fancy one, but one is based on radio waves to control it um, and the other one is based on infrared. Yeah? So one has really this antenna here and the other one has uh, this optical diodes and you need an optical um, um, detector and you can control his little car with this one as well. And basically, I, I want to motivate that we have something very similar in this range to control remote control cells as well. So not with like, okay, I'm, I'm heating the sample and I'm creating a cut and look at the reaction, but rather you, you're using the light similarly as we do it in this uh, remote controlled car, yeah, which has a detector and then you have a processing system afterwards, which upon light irradiation, is doing something and it's very general. I mean, you can connect this detector to, okay, the car, to a robot or to something else. Yeah? And basically we are all having such a system at hand already. Yeah? So because if I'm showing you this one, I'm already remote controlling your neurons in your, in your eyes. Yeah? So basically you have different detectors in your eyes, one basically for this color you have a different detector for this color and you have another detector for this color. So in, at this time, the blue light detector tells your brain, okay, you're seeing just a blue screen, yeah? Or now it tells you, okay, you're seeing a green screen, yeah? And we use that for remote controlling humans all the time, yeah? If you think of it, yeah, we have red light, we know, okay, stop, and green light, okay, you can go, yeah? And, and at that time, you have a light coming hitting your neurons, yeah, or basically your, your photoreceptors, and they are converting the optical signal into an electrical signal which tells your brain to do something, yeah, stop the car or drive the car. And if you look at your detectors we have, we have basically three kinds of detectors, yeah, in blue, green, and red, and okay, we have a force detector which doesn't really, is not so important, but these are the cones in the eye, and then we have rods. Yeah? The rods are mostly for night vision. That's why we only we cannot see color at night. Yeah? And in the field of sharp vision, we only have these rods here. And they are sensible for three colors. And by measuring or somehow comparing the excitation rate of, for example, blue to green, our brain is then mixing colors. Yeah? So based on these how, how all these projectors and TVs and so work, we basically have 
diodes or light sources at these respective wavelengths and depending on the amount of intensity we do that. And all these switches or detectors are working with the same kind of molecules, the so-called opsines, which have these seven domains and these opsines are sitting in the membrane of a cell. And upon light irradiation, we, um, there's a conformational change of a molecule sitting inside of these transhelical domains in the, uh, in the membrane. And this is, for example, the retinal mo molecule. And you see retinal and retina that's somehow dealing with, with our vision. Yeah? And this retinal uh, molecule is changing its bond upon absorbing a photon. So you see it twists around yeah? and thereby pushes a little bit on these seven columns, if you want. Yeah? So you can see that maybe better here. You have this molecule here. These domains are sitting in the membrane of the cell and upon light irradiation, this pore is opened up and positive ions are flowing into the cell. And in, if this is within a neuronal cell, this can lead to electric activation of the cell. So, so you see you have a light pulse, a molecule reacts to the light pulse, yeah, and thereby you activate a cell. <coughs> yeah, so especially, for example, Ed Boyden and Gero Miesenberg and Karl Deiseroth, they pioneered this by putting this switch into neuronal cells of humans, yeah, and then you can activate directly a neuronal cell with light. And this is why it's used so heavily in neurobiology, because now you can have, for example, a mouse brain. You implement these switches in all neuronal cells of the mouse brain, and once you illuminate one brain cell, it starts to fire. And you can start to understand or try to understand how the connections of, um, of these brains work. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, and and basically we we established that in in our lab as well. So you can imagine now we we glue this DNA construct for this optical switch to, for example, the green fusion protein. So then we know once we delivered the gene construct to the cells and they turn green, we know when the cell basically is illuminated with light, we can get, create an action potential. So this basically, we measure this one cell, we illuminate it with a blue pulse, and we get a sharp electrical peak in this cell. So basically, these switches turn open, and then positive ions flow in, and we get a peak. Yeah, and we apply that basically <coughs> in two fields. One is, for example, to create a, a so-called um, cochlear implant where we excite the auditory uh, system of the inner ear with light. Yeah, this is conventionally done with an electrical implant. So they tr try to trigger the auditory nerve inside here. And depending on the position where you're driving an electric field, we get a hearing impression of a, at a different frequency. Yeah? So if you have an electric field at this position, the patient tends to hear maybe like 10 kilohertz tone. If you do it here, it's maybe 8, 6, 5, and so on. So the, the lower the frequency, the more you get to the apex of the, of the cochlea. The problem with electricity is that it spreads quite, has a widespread in, in biological tissue. So therefore, the number of sites where you can stimulate is maybe... Yeah, um, limited to 20 electrodes. Yeah? So therefore, the hearing perception of these people, which are normally deaf, yeah? I mean, they can understand speech, which is a tremendous step forward. But on the other hand, they will never be able to enjoy music. Yeah? Because you have to imagine you, you listen to a music piece uh, or song, which is uh, digitized with 20 bit. Yeah? On, on at least on most of the time, only 10 bit are working. So 10 of these electrodes so for 10 bit is enough for perceiving language and understanding language if you have the reading lips ability as well, but it's not enough. Yeah? And therefore, we try to do that optically. And one uh, pioneer who's, uh, who's doing that um, since a long time is um, um, Tobias Moser in Göttingen close by. He has a whole institute working on that. And he implemented these switches in, um, was it cats? Oh, I think this one is mice. Yeah? 
Um, and basically, you see this are the mod genetically modified mice. This is a wild type. And then he, he, he showed that he can, you see again, a blue light is now for excitation. He could trigger an action potential in the auditory system. Yeah? So this is basically, briefly said, the proof that the, this genetically modified mouse can hear, hear light. Yeah? So you trigger with light uh, a sound perception. But here you see already the problem. Yeah? If you have shorter pulses, five milliseconds, these signals start to spread. Yeah? And this is briefly said, it, it says, OK, they, uh, the, the sound perception doesn't work anymore, or not reliably. And which means, OK, if you want to excite very high frequencies, you see five milliseconds, yeah? that's maybe 200 hertz. Yeah? It's not really high for hearing you have a problem with these switches. And this is because these channel rhodopsin switches used here, they are not made for sound perception and triggering electrical or fast signals. Yeah, they are just for light detection. Basically, channel rhodopsin is from an algae, yeah, a, a, a photosystem, really like ancient photosystem and very slow. And that's why, for example, the whole community tries to come up with faster switches and so on. But in, um, in, in Hanover, together with uh, Oldenburg, um, we try a different approach. And this is that we try to trigger this auditory excitation directly in the brain. So this is a cutout of a mouse brain. And the nice thing is in the mouse brain, it's very similar to the cochlea I've shown you before. And it's true for the human brain as well, that if you stimulate electrically at different positions, you're stimulating a different frequency. Yeah, it's so very, so if you think you put in a needle and you have an electrical tip at, uh, at certain positions, you can basically, this is what this graph shows, you can trigger a different sound perception in the system. Yeah? And as this is a mouse, the, the frequency range is completely different to a human, to much higher. Yeah? So what we want to do is basically that we implant a fiber and we have a genetically modified neural system here and if we now illuminate at different positions we can trigger an auditory signal in this in this brain yeah and here the time scales are much more relaxed compared to the to the outer ear yeah and this is i i have a video from from my colleague Janis Hildebrand who's pioneering that and you see here uh, a mouse which has now a fiber connection with a fiber ending in this inferior colitulus in the auditory cortex of the mouse, and he's stimulating at a certain position this mouse so that the mouse thinks, okay, I'm hearing a tone of, for example, four kilohertz. Yeah? And before the mouse is not deaf, it can hear normally. It was trained with a normal speaker at four kilohertz, then it knows I don't get food, and if this frequency changes to eight kilohertz, it gets a food reward here at this position. Yeah? And now, for the first time, basically, the light is switched on, and it stimulates at the depth for 4 kilohertz. And if you now change the depth to 8 kilohertz, then the mouse should be basically um, running to the food reward, because it learned previously with sound that it should basically check then for the food reward. And you see now there, this blue light resembles the uh, lower frequency, and then if you switch it to the higher frequency, it runs here and basically, yeah. So this is the first demonstration from Yannis, basically, that this mouse has a sound perception based on the, um, on the optogenetics as well. Yeah, so we have other projects which I cannot go into detail, which we perform in, in, in ANOVA as well. One project together with certain uh, companies is that we try to uh, stimulate heart muscles with this optogenetic uh, patches or switches. Yeah? So because you learned already, I work a lot with cardiomyocytes and heart muscles. And we try to stimulate um, the heart with these optical switches. And yeah, basically, I can show you a brief example that this works. Yeah? So you see here the heart muscle tissue. And we projected eight femtosecond pulses or uh, spots basically on this heart muscle and upon illumination we basically can trigger a, a contraction of this heart muscle with this optogenetic switches. Yeah. So these are, I mean, applications which are very close to the standard application of, um, of optogenetics. But I, what I want to end with is that basically there are a lot of different switches now out there, apart from these opscenes, which are similar to our visual system, which are just doing something. Most of the time, it's a conformational change 
when you illuminate it um, with light. Yeah? And you see if you have no light, then it goes back to this state. Yeah? Or you have some systems where you have a binding upon illumination with one wavelength and a non-binding upon illumination with another system, uh, another light. Yeah? So, and this system, for example, Phytochrom B, is very interesting because, okay, the, sorry, this graph is a little bit molecular cell biology complicated, but what you have to look at is just this Pac-Man here, yeah? Phytochrom B. If you illuminate it with 660 nanometer, then this Pac-Man is attaching to this triangle, to PIF6. Yeah? If you illuminate it with 740 nanometer, it's not attached. Yeah? So you have a binding with, with red light, non-binding with infrared light. Yeah? And you have this tail here, and this tail basically leads to the expression of this gene construct. So this is gene of interest. So this is random. I can put in any gene I like at this position here. And upon light irradiation, this gene is read out by the cell and turned on. Yeah? So I can activate any gene I like in a living cell with light, and I can switch it off. Yeah? So I have really a fundamental switch in my cell, yeah? on and off switch, and I can just think of anything I want to switch on and off with my remote control. And that's what basically why optogenetics might be interesting for you at some point as well, because it doesn't really need to do with neurobiology or with uh, uh, exciting muscles, but it, it can be anything. Yeah? As maybe an outlook, I, I pulled up a, a paper already from 2012 yeah, from Bang et al. in Nature Methods, where they coupled a different kind of switch, not phytochrome, a different one, but upon light irradiation, it led to the expression of an RNA, messenger RNA for uh, 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 GLUC, and this RNA is involved in the insulin production. Yeah? So you see where they are heading. Upon light irradiation, insulin production is turned on, and without light irradiation, it's turned off. Yeah? So you have something maybe as a vision, uh, not an injection of insulin for diabetes in the future anymore. You rather have like in, in light irradiation, and you control a cell with light, yeah, non-invasively, without puncturing. So this is just to give you maybe one vision of of what optogenetics might lead to in the future. But basically, it's really a remote control. Others have shown you can guide cells to make them grow in one direction or anything you like. Yeah? So this is what I want to end with. And thank you once more for coming and listening to my lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, so, any questions? Uh, uh, especially the final part is very interesting to me. Uh, so you said, you know, um, how to say, light can switch on or off of the cells, but uh, they, I mean, the cells can, how to say, detect the strength of the light or not? Um, no. No. Mm. No. I mean, it, it depends, okay, on the number of switches. So mm -hmm. usually it's not enough to have one switch in a cell. So if you have, for example, neuronal cells and you want to create an action potential, you need something like, I'd say maybe 300 switches in one cell, yeah? And you need to activate them, so you need a certain intensity to overcome it, and then you get an effect, yeah? But with these other switches of gene expression, we are currently looking at that, yeah, how much light do you need to, to create a, a really good expression of this, and but, uh, that's really depending on the application, yeah? So, and it's not, it's not that you can adjust it to, so the switches are on or off. Yeah? So you have a certain threshold and then it's on. Yeah? And, and then, okay, you can have maybe some adjustment depending if you have several switches and then you, you have a medium intensity. On average, half the switches are on or not. So you can play around with that. But in principle, it's just on and off because it's just a, in most of times, it's a binding or non-binding or it's, it's basically a conformational change from cis to trans. Uh, and that's just a two-level system if you want your switching between. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. I have one question on uh, laser transfection. Is it possible to use that method for uh, multi-layered cells or aggregate of cells? For example, uh, if you consider a single cell is surrounded with other many cells, it is difficult to attach uh, microspheres to the yeah. central cell? 
Yeah, it's um, it's difficult. We tried that in similar in these organoids, like really densely packed cells. And um, if you have smaller particles, they can diffuse between the cells to some degree. Yeah, but you you are limited in penetration depths for sure. Yeah, and that's. I mean, on, on one hand, one thing is getting the cells, uh, the, the particles to the cells to perforate them, but on top of that, you need the DNA to be present at the cell as well, and that's another problem. So yeah, Mitsuhiro, Mitsuhiro had one idea to package the DNA into these microspheres, which I think is very elegant because then you have the DNA at the site where you need it, but it's, that's a problem. Yeah. So if you have a very dense tissue and, and you have no diffusion inside, you cannot transfect inside. Uh, so Thank you. Uh, For the last part of your talk, what is actually limiting the speed of the switches? I assume that the cis to transformation occurs microcurrent picosecond scale. Yeah. So if the channel is op opening, then it relies on the diffusion. So the diffusion is a limiting factor. No, and I think it stays open for quite some time. Just I think the process just to for it to come back is that's what's limiting it. I think the diffusion. Um, yeah. Okay. In, in case of the neuronal cells, it's the diffusion as well. That's true. Yeah. Because um, if you think about how a neuronal cell usually transmit an, an action potential. It's not so much about exchange of charges across the membrane. It's just changing very rapidly the, the permeability. Yeah? So it's just if you change the channels to be open along the membrane, then this is, in principle, the delivery of the action potential. Yeah? It's not that you have an inflow of ions along the way. Yeah? And, and, and if you do it, but optically with the channel rhodopsin, you have this diffusion. So the process is completely different from a normal ex electrical excitation you have in neurons. That's probably one, I would say, I mean, I'm not a neurobiologist, but that's one inherent problem if you apply optogenetics because you have the whole axon filled with these switches and upon light irradiation, you got a heavy inflow of, of charges which are normally not flowing in while the axon is firing, and probably that's yeah, probably that's the reason why it takes so much time for the neuron to recover, yeah, because just the, the mode of signal generation is completely changed. Yeah. Do you have any number on the maximum speed you can achieve? No, I don't. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a neurobiologist, but yeah, I don't know. It would be. Yeah, maybe it's that would be one direction that one tries to more model the way how the normal, yeah, just change the permeability and not the inflow so much. So maybe that's, but. For the first part, you talk about uh, uh, laser surgery for eye, and you talk about now people are interested in the surgery inside the eye. Yeah. And uh, I'm wondering, like, uh, in the laser fabrication, there's issues like filamentation to limit yeah. uh, your precision of yeah. your uh, fabrication. I think maybe this is maybe the same issues in your eye surgery. So, can you talk about how you can deal with these problems? Yeah, it's uh, it's a problem. Yes, for sure. So, even in the beginning of laser surgery and the front part of the eye, people used uh, not very high NA, so moderate NA, and then you know you get filamentation if you have a moderate NA and very high intensities, you get cell focusing, and actually the first patient patients treated in the US with the first commercial systems, they had filamentation uh, channels in, in their eyes. Uh, and that was, uh, the clinical phenomenon was called uh, rainbow glare, uh, because you have to imagine you're you're treating the eye and you're, um, um, yeah, so if you, if you have the eye and then you're treating the eye with a regular, okay, regular pattern, of laser pulses, and what you're doing is you're writing a diffraction grating into the eye, yeah, because each of these spots is then like a long capillary, yeah, 100 microns long. And, um, but luckily, the wound healing after half a year or a year canceled out these modifications and the rainbow glare was gone. But they had really, when they looked at bright light sources, they had rainbow colors around this. Yeah. 
But of course, if you, you're right, so this was in the anterior part where you had, so you can just take a much higher NA and thereby reduce the intensity and you don't get this filamentation. And usually at the front part, the limit is, I would say, 0.2 NA, yeah, uh, concerning the powers you need here. Yeah? So, but if you go to the, to the lens, yeah, then the, the opening angle is already restricted to, to this one because you, you cannot focus more tightly yeah, because of this distance. But um, so far, they, they are using something like 0.2 NA. Yeah? And so the filamentation is not as strong as previously it was before, but you still get that to a degree. But at the moment, the application the people are doing is that they are uh, perforating here, this capsular bag, and then afterwards they are uh, breaking down the lens tissue and this is afterwards extracted. So if you have any, any filamentation in cataract surgery, it doesn't matter because you take out the material afterwards uh, and you need it for cutting of this capsular bag here. And then afterwards the artificial lens is implanted yeah, and, and you have no problem. But the other field where people try to overcome presbyopia, they basically have the lens yeah, and, and they want to create cuts here yeah, and leave it inside here. And then it's really a problem. And for example, there are a, a group in Jena and together with Jeff Squire in, in Boulder, Colorado, they try to apply temporal focusing as well to overcome, to get, again, they want to decrease the peak, high peak intensities to avoid this filamentation. But it's, I mean, briefly said, it's a problem and people try to overcome. One simple thing, if you can, is using high NA and lower powers, but uh, here people tried uh, temporal focusing, but it's not that I know if, if it's clinical available. Usually. For these applications, there are a lot of companies involved, and, and you don't hear much on conferences how they solve the problem already. Yeah, it's <laughs> so uh, there are several clinical studies underway for that phenomenon, and I don't really know how the outcomes are so far. Thank you. Any other question? If not, let's close this uh, lecture and uh, thank you. Thank you, Alex, for the yeah, great presentation, and also thank you all for coming today.